Okay. I wanted to welcome everyone for attending one of the first breakout sessions. Today's breakout session is with Dr. Karen Gavigan, and she is going to talk about teaching the civil rights movement through Library of Congress primary sources and graphic novels. Great, thank you, Megan. I am um, pleased to be here with you all. It's um, under unusual circumstances. I know we all wish we could be face to face, but I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, my background is I was a school librarian for many years, a public librarian and an academic librarian. So I hope some of the ideas um, that I have, no matter what your background is, what kind of librarian you are, um, that you can use these ideas in, in some ways. Um, what I'm gonna do is introduce you um, to the, the project that has gotten me involved with the Library of Congress Primary Sources. And, and graphic novels. And then um, I'm gonna um, go ahead and give you a chance. I'd love to hear what you all are doing um, with civil rights graphic novels, if anything, or, or things that you wanna do. And also social justice graphic novels in general. And, and you'll understand um, why that interests me um, to hear from all of you as well. And I hope we'll have a few minutes to share some ideas among each other. So. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, this uh, whole project um, that I've been involved with at the Library of Congress came about after the Charleston um, shooting, the, the tragedy in 2015 at Mother Emanuel. Um, and the Post and Courier, the Charleston newspaper, had this quote, um, which you can see on your screen. Um, and, and that's sort of the genesis for this project that um, if, if, you know, hopefully. Uh, the, the one positive um, that can come out of, of the shooting is that we all learn, um, you know, if Dylan Roof had been better versed on uh, and uh, learn more about the civil rights movement and all the significant contributions of African Americans, maybe he wouldn't have committed that heinous crime um, in Charleston. So that, that was a very powerful statement as well as a statement by Joe Riley, who was mayor at the time and spoke at um, University of South Carolina winter graduation in December of 2015. And he made the statement um, that I just paraphrased that perhaps it wouldn't have happened if Dylan Roof had known more about Africans Americans and their contributions. Um, and I always, when I do a presentation, remember those who lost their lives and those who were victims. Um, and were injured as well. So these, these are the ones, and some of you may know, um, Cynthia Graham Herb was at a, a librarian in Charleston at the time. Um, one of the things that came out of, of uh, the shooting was I was in um, at ALA and it was in San Francisco that summer. So it was literally just a few weeks, uh, maybe two weeks after the shooting at the most. And, um, uh, Jennifer Tazzarati was the president of SCASL at the time, and she got a, a sort of frantic email from School Library Journal saying, um, as the president of SCASL, could he come up with a list of um, resources, civil rights resources for kids? So she came up with the idea of Charleston Strong, um, which of course was the saying, but creating uh, open source resource on the SCASA web website, which is still up today. Um, Jennifer had a very talented art teacher um, at her school and she got permission from the original artist who did the Charleston Strong um, image that you see on the screen and adapted it with the books. So you can see from the slide, all of the people who contributed. Um, and I, I would steer you towards this because this is a lot of great resources that were created by these, this body of people. Um, and, and as I said, still available. So as librarians, you got, I do a lot of training um, statewide and nationwide on primary sources. And sometimes for classroom teachers, I may need to go into a little more depth. For librarians, you all are aware um, of what primary sources are. Um, but when I started training with the Library of Congress, what amazed me is the tsunami of information they had on primary sources that were available in all of these formats. 
And just on the topic of civil rights, it's just um, incredible uh, what all is available. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. These are some examples of, of different formats that are just on civil rights. On the left, it says um, a man was lynched yesterday. Um, and so a great activity to, to do is to show that and use an analysis tool of, of primary sources and say, where is this? That what, where's the flag flying, what does it mean? Um, and I'll, because we're short on time, I'll tell you that is at NAACP headquarters in New York City. Um, but you can have a great conversation starter. Um, are, are the people who flew the flag, um, are they happy that a person was lynched? Or are they protesting? And, and before it's revealed, learn a lot of, about the um, individual tools. You can see the March on Washington. Um, you can see directions, what a colored man should do to vote, uh, a flyer about a, a, a speech by Rosa Parks, a political cartoon, a slave map, and then an image of Martin Luther King, and then a, um, a, a picture um, at, at a bus station. So these are just, uh, just a plethora of tools that you can use. The Library of Congress has these analysis tools. This is a generic one for any primary source that's available. And so you can see observe, reflect, and question. So you can give it um, to your patrons or to your students um, individually. What, what I recommend depending on age is, is that maybe you model something like the one, one I just mentioned to you, um, you know, with a document camera and, and model it for in person, get them to answer the questions. I always say, you know, librarians, myself anyway, tend to be linear um, and want to go left or right and do it in precise order. This is not, this lends itself to, you know, if you want to ask a question about the picture. So you just move around and, and, and the students answer it. Then you can have them do it in pairs or, and or individually, again, for, ten, for um, whatever their age is. Um, these are the other analysis tools. That's a it's tiny writing, as you can see, but you know they've got it for motion pictures, for music, sheet music, um, for uh, newspapers, for all of, all of these um, formats are available with an individual um, photograph uh, one. And they also have it, uh, one that's available for librarians and teachers that sort of guides you, gives you some prompts. So you don't have to recreate the will every time. It'll give you some prompts to ask the students as they use those tools. So those are great to work with no matter what the age. Um, I wanted to call your attention to the fact that the civil rights lesson plans have been created by educators from around the nation. And those are already available on the website. Um, and and these, these are ones that are national plans. I'll share some with you in a few minutes that are done by South Carolina educators. Um, free materials are available. This is the idea book for educators and it's information about the Civil Rights Act. Um, there also just FYI is a free one that's available on World War One. So these are all in PDF formats on your website and you can print those and have them in your collections or to use in your um, libraries and our classrooms for those of you who are, are teaching. Um, Frank Baker, who I know you all are familiar with, our own, I call him a media rock star um, in South Carolina. I'm sure some of you probably hopefully had the opportunity to hear him present. Well, he has a blog and this one is How Pictures Changed America. And it's by um, Charles Moore, who was a civil rights Photographer. So his quote, I thought, is very powerful. Pictures can and do make a difference. Strong images of historical events do have an impact on society. So that quote sort of leads me into the reason I, I got into um, using graphic novels and primary sources. Um, and I'll go into more of that in a minute. The, the project that we have is a Library of Congress grant for the University of South Carolina for our School of Information Science. In collaboration, we partner with the College of Education. Dr. Daniela Cook and I um, are, are co-partners on the grant. And as of this coming year, we'll have, it'll be about a half million dollars um, that we've been funded to go around the state. And if you're interested in us coming and speaking to your group, we're happy to do it. 
Um, part of the grant funding was to fund a website. So this is our website on the project um, that has a lot of resources that are available. I mentioned the speech that Joe Riley said that's on the um, on the website and you can hear a clip um, about that. Um, and we share the lesson plans that I just showed you and then we share ones that were created through the project in which we're educating K-12 librarians and teachers to educate their students and we train them on this and um, then they go out in the schools. You can see by grade level, we have it broken down. And again, these were created by librarians and teachers um, uh, statewide from districts all over. So um, wherever you work, hopefully you can find one um, that may be uh, an educator that you know who created it. Um, if you're not familiar with the teachers network and using the word teachers is synonymous with librarians. So um, this is a great resource. It's a, a listserv that you can, you know, you can control it as far as how often you hear from it. You can get daily or, or weekly or bi-weekly updates, but um, it, it allows you to go in in any category you want. You can choose uh, World War One, immigration, any, any topics um, that are related to STEM and, and go in and then you can get notified of activities that go on and resources that are available. For example, um, when John Lewis passed away, Um, pertaining to um, graphic novels. So the um, Little Rock Nine, this is one that's uh, available for grades four and up. It actually is, is viewing Little Rock situation through the eyes of, of the teens that experience themselves in, in this account. Um, and then the pictures that are available are, are pretty amazing um, that are available on the site. As you can see, there's the rally at the state capitol um, there's another image of a, a, a young African-American um, boy in a field, and he is actually witnessing this group of hostile um, protesters marching from the Capitol um, to the high school. And, and, and it's just him looking like not fathoming at all what is going on with the, the violence and the hatred. Um, there is the Little Rock Nine that's a graphic history of the civil rights movement. The, the young man that I spoke about, you can see him in this picture where the crowd is moving to Central High. So what powerful images to share, you know, maybe before they read the book or after whatever works best for your audience. If you're a public librarian and doing it as a, as a, a book club um, or academic librarian sharing it um, with with any students coming in who are working on the civil movement. Rosa Parks, um, there's really a wealth of materials on her. Um, this that you see on your screen is, is challenging to read, obviously, but um, it's her, she kept a diary and this is her early childhood memories when her father left, um, when she had a younger um, sibling was born and, and the father just abandoned them. So that's one of the earlier photos of her. Look at the number of items that are available, um, 7,500 in the manuscript division alone, and then 2,500 photographs. So, um, you know, if, if you are uh, doing anything with patrons and students about Rosa Park, this is, is a gold mine for you. Um, I love to share the one that, that's on your screen. This was written in her handwriting by her right after the bus incident in which uh, I'll read it to you, it's a little difficult to follow. I had been pushed around all my life and felt at this moment that I couldn't take it anymore. When I asked the policeman why it had to be pushed around, he said he didn't know the law was the law, you're under arrest and I didn't resist. I love when I'm talking to teachers to point out the fact that she self-edited this. She really wanted this statement to be right and, and went in and and self-edited it. So it's a, it's a good point to, to tell students the importance of, of getting things right and taking the time to edit. So you can see these additional graphic novels on all levels um, uh, about Rosa Parks that you could com compare with some of those Library of Congress resources. 
Martin Luther King, um, uh, um, amazing materials there. Um, for those of you who might work with younger kids, children's services librarians, um, there's so many picture books, Martin's Big Words and all kinds about Rosa Parks as well, of course. But, um, you know, you could pet play um, just a clip of his I Have a Dream speech if you did Martin's Big Words and let them actually hear his voice. Of course, you're not going to play the whole thing for younger kids, you might for olders. Um, older patrons and, and kids, but you know, the audio that they have has the beginning with the singing of We Shall Overcome and, and what a powerful way to hear his voice and then associate him with any books, not just graphic novels that you might share, as well as um, other resources. Um, one of the seminal works on King is the one to the left, and this is more. Um, older kids, high school kids, and adults. Some of you, you know, may have already read it. And then there's the graphic history of the civil rights movement and then um, graphic universe and graphic library also. So these are all, again, different age levels that, that you can work with um, with your patrons. I love um, to show this image of the March on Washington. And, and I make the point that when you're working with students in this generation, and you say that there was a huge march in Washington on the mall, um, the first thing that's gonna come to their mind is living in Columbia, I would say Columbiana Mall, um, whatever your respective mall is in, in your towns. That's what they think. They don't necessarily know what a mall is. They also have no idea when they read in a textbook and it says thousands um, of, of people were at the mall, but to, when they read it, as I said, in, a, in text. But when they see this image, which looks like just millions of ants, and when they realize um, these are people there and, and what the event is about, it's just really a powerful way for them to learn. And it brings that time period to life for them in ways that dry textbooks cannot. Um, so this is a wonderful site that's commemorating the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Um, lots of great resources you can see from um, the, the navigation bar on there, some of the links that you can go to. But it was a huge um, exhibit that was there um, in the Library of Congress, and, and they save these exhibits like the Mar Rosa Parks one and then make them digitally accessible. So you can't talk about the March on Washington without John Lewis, and um, may he rest in peace. Um, a lot a lot of materials available, especially since um, he passed away. One of my uh, biggest regrets is I, I had the great pleasure of sitting next to him coincidentally on an airplane. Um, and I use March in all my graphic novel presentations. So I told him about the Civil Rights Project. I told him about what we were doing in South Carolina. And he so kindly, he asked me a lot of questions. He was really interested in learning about South Carolina um, students and, and patrons learning about um, uh, his work. And um, he invited me to come to his office the next time I came to a Library of Congress meeting um, because he said he had such a display, of, you know, almost a museum in, in his office that he wanted me to see um, and, and take back and, and tell my students about. Um, and unfortunately, he passed away because before I could do that, but he was an amazing, I really enjoyed the conversation with him and, and I admire his body of work so much. So as you know, he talks about good trouble and, and these, these images that are available through the Library of Congress show um, him and the many, many arrests and, and uh, conflicts with violence uh, that he had. So Selma, uh, Bloody Sunday is the one that those of you who have, have read the March trilogy um, know how much is involved in that. By the way, I did ask him because I had read that there was going to be a follow-up to the March series called Rise. Um, and I asked him about it and um, it kind of makes me wonder if he knew at the time about um, his cancer um, and, and how serious it was because he said, well, um, we're working on it, but he wouldn't, wouldn't go further than that. So I am curious if anyone follows up and and continues the series um, since he passed away. Um, but these are some fascinating pictures. If you look 
um, on, on the screen, the top picture to the left, he's in the uh, beige trench coat. He was the leader who marched across the bridge at the very front with their arms locked. Then you can see him tragically underneath. He's, he's the man that's being beaten down on the ground. As, as those of you who know who read the book or, or followed um, his life, his skull was cracked that day um, by the, the state police. And then this is an excerpt from March that shows the bridge and, and um, you know, the horror of it. The black and white, I think, makes it so effective um, in that trilogy as well. So, you know, don't forget to go and look. And there's so many videos I mentioned and other things available. He spoke at the Library of Congress um, several times. And so they have the videos where he talks about his life as well as more images and documents from the time. Um, some of you may know that Harper Lee's book To Kill a Mockingbird is now a graphic novel. And um, I, I remember I was presenting one time in one district in the state and a, um, an, a teacher, an English language arts teacher told me she taught book for 10 years and she was thrilled to see this lesson plan that has ties the book to a lot of resources at the Library of Congress. So she said it opened up a whole lot of ideas for ways she could share um, the novel um, with, with um, young people. Harriet Tubman, if you're not familiar with Nathan Hale's graphic novels, it's a series, very popular for middle school, but um, older as well. Um, but it, I mean, he's written for everything from the Donner Pass, which of course grips the students, grabs their attention. Um, but this one is about Harriet Tubman um, and, and her life. And as you can see from the screen, there's so many resources available on the Library of Congress site that if they're interested in the graphic novel and want to learn more, um, you can take them to this site and, and share a lot of uh, these resources that are available. Um, the Life of Frederick Douglass, this is um, an excellent graphic novel, um, a little more recent than the uh, Nathan Hill one. Um, on Tubman, but you can see at the bottom of the screen, his papers are actually available at the Library of Congress, a considerable collection. Um, on the right of your screen, you can see um, he's got the, the North Star, which was an abolitionist newspaper that he edited, he started and edited, and you can get copies of that. Um, but what, what fascinated me when I, and this, the life of Frederick Douglass is told through his eyes. Um, and it starts out with him, um, you know, in slavery and then how his incredible life developed. But what I found so interesting, um, and, and you see this when you look at the pictures um, that the Library of Congress has, is he very pointedly um, made sure that he did not smile in his pictures because he, he, slavery was so evil and wrong and such an injustice that he never wanted to be seen smiling. Um, and it, so it's interesting to share that fact um, with others and, and let them go in and then look and see. Um, in fact, they said he was actually photographed more than Abraham Lincoln in that, in that um, and so that, that's something unusual too. He wanted to be photographed, he made it. Um, you know, one of his missions, but to have the look that you see on the screen. And I just thought that was a very powerful um, message. So sports are, are popular with um, a, a lot of young people and uh, um, Satchel Page striking out. This is the Center for Cartoon Studies and they produce others. Um, Houdini, Helen Keller, if you're not familiar with those, um, they're excellent, but this is, um, the Jim Crow era, and um, you can see that the Library of Congress had a, a big um, presentation display that they have for a while on baseball, race relations, and, and Jackie Robinson, which would interest um, a, a lot of um, young people. This is one that I've just read recently that I, I just kind of fell in love with, and I think it's just got a lot of neat options. Um, it's called Showtime at the Apollo. If you, if you haven't read it, um, I, I highly recommend it. So it's about um, Harlem um, and, and the Apollo Theater. Um, they even have created a Spotify playlist 
So as they introduce the artist um, throughout the book, um, you know, you can listen to the playlist of the songs by the artists that they performed at the Apollo. And boy, it is a veritable smorgasbord of um, top, top African-American artists. Uh, you know, Bo Jangles, the dancer, Red Fox, the comedian, and of course, um, everyone from Whitney Houston to uh, Michael Jackson um, that, that, you know, current kids might know a little better than some of, some of the earlier ones. But um, during Roosevelt's New Deal, they had the um, Work Project Administration. And so, the, the, as you might recall, um, in history, they hired writers to, to employ them. Um, after the depression, and, and so this was a writer who made money from the WPA, um, from the New Deal, and, and went and wrote, did an interview and wrote an article, um, and it's, the subject is Amateur Night in Harlem, um, and it's about the, the bias, um, so they show the, the glamorous side, um, and this is what I love about this book, the glamorous side of their life, um, performers and how they made it big starting out at the Apollo but then they show the, the bias and they, they it weaves it throughout and this interview the WPA interview would be a really neat piece um, to share um, after uh, you know they read read the graphic novel uh, maybe listen to the playlist um, I will say too if you get a chance the Apollo Theater website does an amazing job um, for librarians and educators because they have um, a lot of resources available. Um, one is called The Legends and it goes into a lot of detail um, about you know, the, the, the big names um, that are there in, in the theater um, and then how they made it and, and a lot of um, information there. So it's, it's a wealth of information that, um, in addition to the Library of Congress. Um, and the Library of Congress has um, photographs of, of from the Apollo Theater uh, and a video clip of, of Mr. Bojangles in one of, of the movies that he was in. So that would be of interest to um, young people. So I've shared some of these pictures. What I like about um, the Gareth Eastman's publishing um, is that they're starting to um, add names that aren't, all, you always think of, uh, and my colleague, um, in the College of Education is African American and um, she's a social studies teacher and she she is it really um, encourages people to get beyond just Rosa Park, just Martin Luther King, um, and to learn about other African Americans who um, you know are, are all of their contributions too. And so you can see and they're adding more all the time and then there are also um, other publishers that are featuring civil rights uh, graphic novels and how to use them. Wanted to share with you, um, so that was um, all the result of the Library of Congress grant. Um, I have a colleague in Australia and I are working on social justice graphic novels and we're writing an article um, that, that'll be coming out in School Library Connection. Um, I have an article coming out in Knowledge Quest that's about the civil rights um, books that I just talked about in more detail, um, and that'll be in the January, February issue. But as part of a Carnegie Whitney grant, an ALA Carnegie Whitney grant, um, we've created a website for our project. Um, it is still a work in progress, so um, we've got a, a, a lot of work to do on it, but I just want you're the first group I've shared it with. Um, so it will say social justice topics, um, and it's immigration, it's mental health, uh, addiction issues, it's war, the tragedies of war, racism, obviously, a lot of these and a whole bunch more. There's so many more and I hope we can discuss the, these before it ends. So you can browse by topic, you can browse by title. Um, we're we're going to work to create resources that are available for librarians and educators, such as what I just mentioned, the Apollo Theater. Um, and their resources and the Library of Congress resources and a lot of others that can tie um, to, to some of the um, graphic novels that, that we discussed. If, and on an aside, if you're not familiar with this grant, it's the ALA Carnegie Whitney grant. You can um, Google it. It's been going on for years now. 
Um, it's a, a $5,000 grant and they award several at a time. Um, and if you go on the site and look, it's absolutely amazing um, how many, a, a, a lot of people as part of it, in fact, that's sort of think it's expected that, that you create a, a, a digital access document like a website or a Weebly um, for people to access. And so the topics are everything imaginable. Um, and so take a look at that site and then consider applying for it. Um, it's not too challenging an application. And um, Casey Garrison from Charles Sturt University and I um, won it. So you have two years to use the $5,000 um, and, and then you, you know, develop the project. We used it to create, to pay for a web um, person who's working on it now, as I said, it really is, it's got a ways to go. Um, but the other thing is it paid for us to go to conferences and present. Um, so we went to ALA and AASL and it covered our expenses to travel. Uh, and of course, we always mention the grant, which, which I wanted to make you aware of as well. And I also will reiterate that um, uh, if you want more information about the Library of Congress grant, just um, email me and let me know about that. So I wanted to allow a few minutes um, for you all, and so I hope you'll take your unmute and, and discuss some things, or I think um, Megan is, is checking the chat room if you'd rather chat your questions in. Um, and Megan, if anybody's asking any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those before we start. But these are just three bullets that I thought might get some conversation going. Um, are any of you using civil rights graphic novels now? How, if so? Um, how about other civil rights resources that you've shared with your patrons and um, students? And how about any other social justice graphic novel titles that, that you're excited about? Um, I, I hope I've got some graphic novel fans and, um, in the group that'll uh, want to speak up or if, if you have any questions. So Megan, any questions? Um, we have not had any in the chat yet. Okay, all right. If anybody wants to fire any off at me, just you know, un, just uh, put your mic on and, and ask me any questions. Or if you um, want to share some that you've read recently, or you know, if any of you read some of the ones I mentioned that you'd like to comment on. Don't be shy. <laughs> Do any of you use graphic novels or primary sources, the, um, the Library of Congress site? Um, if those of you who are educators who, who um, are teaching, they have redesigned just in August. So heads up on that, the teacher's website to access primary sources and they've um, made it more accessible. Um, the site that we mentioned, um, that I mentioned previously, um, is, is a way to sort of uh, drill down on some of the resources that are available to you. Any comments or questions? I like it. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I like it. It was really good. And the re reason I came here because I don't read so many graphic novels. I just want to learn oh. more about it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you came. And um, do take a look. We do have the titles all in the site that I mentioned. Um, it's just the re additional resources that we want to add. Mm -hmm. um, and also, ALA, um, if you're looking for graphic novels for teens, the young adult, uh, y'all's a young adult service, um, uh, they have a great graphic novels list for teens. So just Google Yaza and um, great graphic novels for teens. Mm -hmm. Anybody who might be looking for younger ones, Alice does an amazing list for graphic novels that they update um, as well. So I, those are some go-to sites um, to get really quality ones. The thing I love about Yaza is that they keep, they put their, they have a committee and they keep their nominations up. So they don't wait until the end. They, they always are posting what they're reviewing themselves. So you don't have to wait 
till the end of the year to know, you know, kind of what's taught. You can go see what they're reviewing. Also the Eisner Award, um, and that's another grant I would encourage people to apply for, the Eisner Graphic Novel Award Grant. Um, that's available for libraries and, and to develop library collections. Um, it's, a, it's a very generous award. There are two awards. One is for a project um, and, and I received that with um, Susan Nair, who's a librarian at the um, Juvenile Justice Library um, to do a graphic novel project um, with the students, the incarcerated youth. And it's been won at all kinds of libraries. So you, and they give you as part of it, the entire Eisner Awards collection for that year um, for free. And then you get money um, to use um, to develop your own collection and, and, and for other things like travel to conferences and things. So the Eisner Award um, graphic novel grants are great by ALA as well. Does anybody know of other grants that are available? Sometimes um, I know um, uh, school librarians have, have gotten grants through um, Dollar General and GoFundMe and other sources like that to try to build up graphic novel um, collections as well. Dr. Gavigan, can you uh -huh. hear me? Yes. Oh, yay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm having some issues with my uh, audio today, but um, we just, I'm Lisa Aiken. I'm with the State Library oh, and we just so added, cool. we just added some graphic novels to one of our um, discus databases or our vendor did actually we purchased those to add to discus so i'm really excited about them i'm not sure if these are in there though and i'd like to check that do you have a is i think you mentioned is there a list somewhere of, of the of what you've covered today yeah if you go to the um let me go back on the slide thank you sure 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 i was trying to take notes but i'm, I'm sure i missed <laughs> something um where did i go with it Hang on. Um, not that one. Let's see where I've got it. I'm making it a Disney problem. Here, it's right there. You see that URL? Um, yes. Yeah, and maybe somebody can put it in the chat. And, um, so that um, will take you, it, like I said, it's a work in progress, so don't judge. We got, we got to get the images up and everything. But if you look under Browse by Title, um, now these are for teens, Lisa, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's it's by title and these are ones um, we reviewed, we reviewed, um, we used some of the resources I just told you about, y'all's, um, but we also went to libraries in Australia and the US, including the Library of Congress and including our own skills. Um, and, and just got hand up, hands on with these titles and then included them on those various topics. I love hearing that Discus is gonna cover it. What, um, what is, that's great. I can't wait to tell my students that. So what is the um, site? Is it? Um, um, SC Disc, well, you can look at, at it's scdiscus.org. And I was trying to remember, and this is terrible, but, um, I think it's Tumble Books that Tumble Books. has added the graphic okay. novel novels. I think that's okay. the that's the database that's part of Discus. I don't know if yeah. I have any. Yeah, I'm, in fact, I'm I'm nearly positive that it's okay. Um, okay. Tumble yeah, Books I know Tumble Books, and, and my yeah. students are aware of that. So I'll I'll pass that on to them, especially now with the virtual. Situation. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. And I I I typically myself don't usually read graphic novels, but mm -hmm. I um, I actually have looked at a couple that you had on here and they're oh, fantastic good. Good. yes and so i'm excited to share these even more so thank I'm you very glad. much i'm glad i'll tell you for those of you who have young kids or, or children's librarians another wonderful site i didn't include it in this lecture because of the um age of these books but it's called itunes i-t-o-o-n-s dot org and what is incredible about it is it's actually um Art Spiegelman, who wrote Mouse, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and his wife, um, and she is the cartoonist for New Yorker magazine. She's French, um, and they are passionate, passionate about graphic novels and getting them into the hands of young children. And so iTunes, their site, 
has the books that are um, the iTunes award-winning books. They've won a ton of awards, but they also have them read aloud so the kids can advance the books and they have it in six languages. So I even had a French teacher tell me one time that she uses iTunes books with her high school French students and it's their favorite activity because they can hear it in French and read the little the plot and, and learn the words quicker. So it can be used by all ages, but it's an amazing free resource, especially during these times. So check check that out by Spiegelman. And his wife is um, in French name, I cannot recall um, her last name. Does anybody remember or, or know of that? But that's, that's a great resource to, to share with people who work with younger kids or for any of you who have kids in the home. Any other questions? You know, um, I, I'm glad Lisa said she doesn't always read graphic novels. It's funny because I, I do graphic novel research, but um, on my bedside table, I don't always have graphic novels. I just, I get it that the, the students just love them. I, I did a circulation study on middle school libraries in North Carolina and South Carolina, and the circulation statistics were staggering. Um, and I'd love to hear from those of you who work in libraries to see if, if you find the same thing. So I, I studied um, six libraries, three in each state, and um, uh, say their, their total collection um, the graphic novel percentage of the collection would range from anywhere from about five to 12%, but the circulation was huge. Like one, her collection was 29% of the entire circulation of a, a middle school library. So, you know, sometimes getting reluctant readers in who read them um, can lead them to other, other books or, or just get them hooked on reading uh, when they've been illiterate readers in the past. It, do any of you all see similar circulation patterns um, in your libraries or any of you um, public librarians or academic librarians? Do you, do you see that as well? Well, it's, um, it, it's something that I had heard anecdotally and then um, the assignments I give in a a class that I teach is a collection analysis and they have to report out on circulation for all collections. And, and it just was amazing to me to see um, the perspective, you know, to, to see the data because it, it, was, it was really interesting. I don't have um, anything else unless there's some more questions or anything in the chat. Um, Dr. Gavigan, I was just gonna say, um, I so I'm pretty boring. I like to read biographies and like history stuff. Yeah. Which, so one of the one of the ones that I had read uh, that you mentioned was the Roosevelt's New Deal. Yes. Project. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting. But um, the larger point that I wanted to make was I think that these are such so such valuable resources because they're positively identifying people of color, and so it gives yes. and, and that's sort of what we talk about at the. At, at my library anyways, finding resources where people can identify it with a positive example. Yeah. And so I think that these are just incredibly valuable. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Yeah, and that's the goal is the, the windows and mirrors perspective of um, yes. allow, allowing the reader to, to see others and then, um, or to see if they're, are marginalized or, or minorities to see themselves when often in other texts they, they don't. So um, I just, you know, March is just such a phenomenal book. For this project, um, we are getting this out. Um, part of the funding is to get the series out to some educators who are teaching in their districts, um, civil rights. And it's, it's backward we can't get the book in. I mean, since he, he passed away, there's been such a renewed interest in it, which is, you know, it's sad for me because I want to get this in the hands of these teachers, but I'm, I'm thrilled that that book is getting obviously in, in a ton of people's hands because it's been backward for, since he died. 
we, we can't get copies of it. So, um, and it's, if you're not familiar with it, a lot of um, schools, public libraries, towns are, have used it as, you know, a, a, the book for a, a, a all read, um, you know, middle school all read, high schools all read. Um, some colleges have used it as their required reading for incoming freshmen, but it's an, it's an amazing series. And I love the Apollo one. Um, I think if anybody works with theater or art, um, uh, you know, educators that, that they would be interested in that because sometimes it's hard to find, uh, you know, a topic like that that can touch so many things with the singers and the dancers and the comedians too, so. Well, I, um, I have to be honest, I wasn't sure how many people could be here. Um, for the first round. I know some people might not be able to come in until afterwards. So I'm delighted to, that those of you joined us who did. And thank you for the great comments and questions. I appreciate that. Um, but if you have, let me get to the last slide. If you have any questions for me, um, here is my email address. I'm happy to take any emails or if you want a copy of this presentation, I'm happy to share it. You can share it with anybody. Um, just shoot me an email. And if, if you have any interest in, in us, um, Danielle or myself coming and speaking to your group, just let us know. So thank you, Megan, for organizing this and including me in the um, conference. And I hope to see some of you at, or all of you who are alumni at the next event. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.